I can say anything. Oh, now I can't. It's on. It's being recorded. So we'll go with that. Good to see you guys, man. That's like the biggest understatement that I've ever made. Who would have ever dreamed? You might want to cut the reverb off too. There you go. I mean, I know it sounds all godlike to have it echo through the house, but uh, yeah. Who would have ever thought? Thanks, bud. No, my battery's good, man. But I appreciate it. No, I'll keep it anyway. Uh, who would have ever thought that quickly, man? Life could change. And, uh, you know, one week, I, I think the last week we met, we were kind of like, eh, you know, we'll see how this goes. And then eight weeks later, it's crazy, you know. So anyway, glad to be back in God's house with you, and uh, just goes to show you that the church is not a building, it's the people, and I want to say this, that um, our church has been amazing through this. I've, I've been, don't take this the wrong way, but our church is only a little over three years old, so I was kind of nervous, you know what I'm saying? Because if you've got a church that's well established, it's a little different, but man, all you folks of the Ridge Church have been incredible through your support, through your prayers, through your giving. It's been unreal. I think everybody deserves a big round of applause this morning for that. I also think every lady in the house deserves a special round of applause for not killing her husband through this. I mean, we missed Mother's Day, but golly, we want to honor you especially this year. But uh, And uh, by the way, we have a gift for you on the way out, so if you want to pick it up, at the Welcome Center, we have a beautiful little pin for you, uh, just, to, just a token of our appreciation for all the mamas. Amen? Thank God for mama. Go to Luke chapter 17 this morning. Luke chapter 17, you'll have to excuse me, I've gotten used to preaching to an empty room and amen and applauding myself to a message. So um, you guys just keep it down a little bit. Don't be too lively. You might scare the Lord. Amen? Some Christians act, you would think they were going to scare Jesus if they got too excited. But, uh, man, we get excited about all kinds of stuff. Ball games, football games, volleyball games. If you're from another country and you like soccer, you might get excited about that. But, man, nobody's ever done for me what Jesus has done for me. And I think we should be more excited about him now than ever. And, uh, again, man, just... The fact that we've taken our liberty, liberty for granted, uh, who would have ever believed in the United States of America we'd be on lockdown where you couldn't even go to church? It's crazy, but it happened. And uh, I pray that we're pulling out of it. I believe that we are. But uh, I, I hope we, as a church we don't come back the same. I've been excited about getting back to normal, at least in a normal schedule and normal routine. But I hope we never get back to normal in just the sense that we never cease to be in awe of the goodness of God, and we never take for granted what he's done for us. So, man, this text has just had me this week. If you're a student of the Bible, sometimes, sometimes a certain passage of Scripture will just grab you and, and arrest your attention. And, and this one has been oddly recurring in my life. It seems like uh, every time I open my Bible, whether it's just in my daily reading or my devotion time with my kids, uh, I keep coming back to the same passage. And, um, and to be quite honest with you, I didn't really understand the magnitude of what the Lord was saying through the text, uh, really up until just Friday afternoon, I was praying over it. I knew this is the passage God wanted me to take, but I kept saying, Lord, I mean, I got to do more than get up and read it, right? I mean, unless you guys are good with that. Uh, but, you know, in my head, in my heart, I'm thinking, you got to give me, you know, I know what you're saying to me, but I, you got to give me something here. And I uh, got a breakthrough Friday, and God just really revealed to me what he was trying to say through this passage. So I want you to look in Luke chapter 17, verse number 11. It says, Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. They lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. So let's just pause right here and comment for a moment. Jesus is passing through really a region that was dominated by Gentile people. These were not predominantly uh, Jewish regions, mostly Gentile folk like us lived in this area. I've traveled to Israel many times. I've been to Galilee, which, by the way, is probably my favorite place to visit, oddly enough, in Jerusalem. You know, you have the Temple Mount, the Dome of the Rock, 
Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives. You've got all these, these high and holy sites that we read about in the Bible. But for me, I love being in Galilee just because that's where our ancestors come from. You say our ancestors, what do you mean by that? I mean the rednecks who didn't fit in <laughs> with, with the popular people. It was, it was the outcasts that didn't live among the religious. They were not, they just, I mean, they just were not congruent with the religious um, ideologies and, and so, social, you know, statuses of the day. These people lived out in the country. They were farmers. They were sheep herders. They were hunters and fishermen. This is where Jesus found all his disciples, by the way, most of them by the Sea of Galilee. And so as Jesus in Luke 17 is passing through this region, it says that 10 lepers stood afar off. As Jesus was passing by, I understand he wasn't in close proximity with them. No one was because if you were diagnosed with leprosy in that day, you were pushed outside of the camp. You were not allowed to live among the common people. You couldn't dwell in a neighborhood or a subdivision. If you lived uh, in what they call a kibbutz over there, you were put out because leprosy was so highly contagious and incurable that the only thing they knew what to do with them was to isolate them and place them in solitary confinement with other people. People who had leprosy. So you have these 10 men who are standing way outside from, from society, way away from everybody else. else. And as Jesus is passing by, they begin to cry out and they called so loudly, they made such a racket and such a noise that, that Jesus took notice of them. And when he took notice of them, he didn't approach them. There were other times that, that Christ would do the unthinkable. He would li literally lay his hands upon a leper, which again was a death sentence in that day. To touch someone with leprosy, really you were just writing your own death certificate. But in this case, Jesus didn't approach them. He didn't touch them. He simply called out to them and he said, go show yourselves to the priest, which was in correlation with Old Testament Law in the book of Levitic Le Leviticus chapter 13 and chapter 14, you find that if a person even thought they had leprosy, so if you had a boil on your arm or on your shoulder, if you had some spot in your skin that you didn't know what it was, it wasn't a pimple, it wasn't an ingrown hair, we can get real gross if we want to, right? Uh, you would go to the priest. You didn't go see the doctor necessarily. You would go see the high priest just to get an examination and see if what you had was leprosy. And if the priest declared you to, to be infected with leprosy, that is when you would be put outside the camp. And if anybody approached you, you had to put a cloth over your face and cry unclean, unclean, which is how I walk through Walmart nowadays, amen, <laughs> just to freak people out. By the way, if I wear a mask to Walmart, it's going to be a Zorro mask. I ain't putting one over my mouth. Nothing can penetrate this beard anyway. So the beard did survive COVID-19. Amen. Thank you. No, thank you. It's all, it's all the beard, not me. Um, but so these lepers cried out, and Jesus told them to do according to the law. He said, go present yourselves to the priest. And it says in the text that as they went, in verse number 14, they were cleansed. So as they responded to, to the command of Jesus, in their journey, just the little simple exhibition of their faith to go and follow Christ's command to present themselves to the priest, it says they found cleansing and they found healing. It's amazing the small steps that we can make in God's direction and he'll respond to those steps. But watch this, there's more to it. And so in verse 15, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks and he was a Samaritan. Again, so God points out his, his ethnic background. He was a Samaritan. Samaritans were kind of like the, uh, the lower of the lower class with, when it came to Gentiles, right? So uh, Gentiles is just a term that encompasses anyone who's not a Jew. So if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. But Samaritans were even lower as far as, as classifications were concerned in those days. And it points out the fact that he was a Samaritan. He didn't have any notoriety with the public or with the religious crown. He was just simply a Samaritan. And not only that, he was a leper. And he now found healing. He'd obeyed the simple command that Jesus gave to him. And he was cleansed. But it says that he turned around and he returned to give glory to God. And he fell on his face and he gave Jesus thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So in verse 17, watch what happens. And here's what just kind of got a hold of me. It says, Jesus responded to him he said were there not 10 that were cleansed there I, I I know that there were 10 of you 10 lepers and I and I I know that when I sent you to see the priest right like it didn't take Jesus by surprise that he was going to heal them he said I know 10 of you were cleansed but where 
are the nine. Verse 18, were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. That little statement, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith has completed you. Your faith has altogether cured you. And so this morning, this is the thought that keeps swirling through my head. Are you healed or are you whole? Ten were cleansed. Ten were delivered of leprosy. But only one was declared to be whole altogether. See, healing is external. We're always looking for the external deliverance. We're always looking for external salvation. We're always looking for external deliverance. Healing is external, but wholeness is internal. Healing works, but wholeness knows how to worship. Healing is God working around you. Wholeness is God working in you. There were 10 saved, but only one served. The 10 found faith, but only one put feet to his faith. See, here's where I'm at this morning. There are far too many believers who are not believing. Should I say that again? You're a believer, but are you believing? You have been cleansed, but are you living out the faith that God brought to life inside of you? There are far too many saved who aren't serving, far too many who are Christian, but not Christ following. They're secure, but not sanctified. They're blessed, but not blessing. They're resurrected, but not living daily in the power of Christ's resurrection that has been appropriated on your behalf and my behalf. See, here's where God's heart is this morning. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 23, he said, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly or completely. In other words, God didn't come just to punch your bus ticket to heaven. He came to give you life abundantly. He came to sanctify and cleanse and bring you into this abundance and into this thriving and into this place where you're not just getting by, but you're absolutely living the best life that God has planned and prepared for you on this earth. I'm thankful every single day of my life for heaven, but we're not home yet, children. And it's time that we as believers understand that I'm glad I've got a testimony that 21 years ago I fell on my knees and I called on Jesus as a leper who was outcast and dirty in my sin and Jesus cleansed me and he set me free. But if that's all I've got to testify of, that is a fairly weak testimony this morning. Because the Bible says it's God who works in you, present tense, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So Paul's prayer was that God himself would sanctify you wholly or completely. And he said, may your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so what's the difference between healing and wholeness? What's the difference between being saved and, and really living? in the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit. I want to share just a few thoughts with you that God put on my heart this morning, and we'll hurry because I know there are kids in here, and I know your children love to hear me preach, but you'll probably have to pee here in about five minutes. So I'm, I'm going to let you get out of here, all right? Let me give you just three simple thoughts this morning on the difference between wholeness and healing. Number one, I want to say that wholeness is the product of a strong root system. Wholeness is the product of a strong root system. There, there has to come a point in your faith when you have more than what is on the surface. There has to come a point in your faith when, when there's more to you than going to church on Sunday. Now, I've said this, and if you've been watching my videos, videos, you've heard me say it. I'm really getting tired of hearing people say, see, this is what church has always been about. We don't need a building. No, we do. And we don't need the building, but we do need a place to get together and meet as God's people. There's something powerful about the assembling of ourselves together. But on the other side of that coin, if all you have in your relationship with Christ is a Sunday morning meeting and possibly if you're real spiritual, a Wednesday night Bible study, you are not living in the power and the, and the glory and the grace that God intends to give to you. 
So even though I disagree with that statement, I do understand that statement because for far too long, God's people, Christian people, have identified with the church that we go to and the church defines me and what happens on Sunday is really the most important thing in my life when in reality, when you come to church on Sunday, that ought to just be like the dessert at the end of the dinner. Sunday ought to be the time that we all come together cranked up, fired up, excited to be in the house of God. Man, that we had people sitting in the parking lot at 7.30 this morning. Had people standing out in the rain saying, man, let me in. I was like, no, church don't open until 8.30. So I'm glad to see a, a, a reinvigorated sense of excitement. That was a joke for those of you that don't know me. Uh, but I'm glad to see that, that, that rejuvenated sense of excitement about coming to the house of the Lord. But I pray that during this last eight weeks, being isolated, right? Being, being in a place where, you know, you, you can only look at Facebook for so long. Being in a place when you can only, only watch so many fight videos on YouTube. I'm speaking of my wife. <laughs> you can only watch so much Netflix. I hope you've gotten to a place where, where you found yourself in, in solitude and in the presence of God and you've let God really dig down in your heart into what I call the root system because wholeness is a product of having a strong root system. Let me give you a few passages of scripture on this passage, on this, on this point. Psalm chapter one, verses one through three says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law does he meditate on Sunday and Wednesday. You see, it's on the screen, so you can read along with us right there at the bottom. Uh, it says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. Now watch what it says. It says, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, which brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does, whatsoever he does, shall prosper. So God said, when your delight is in him, when you reach this point that the, that the band don't have to do your favorite song for you just to enjoy being in church, when you reach this point where it doesn't, the, the stories don't have to jive with you and all the illustrations don't have to go along with your, your way of thinking, it's just the fact that you're in the presence of the word of God, that you delight yourself and you find out that there's more to it than just coming and getting spoon fed on a Sunday. Although it is the pastor's job to feed the church, it's not the pastor's job to feed the church seven days a week. Amen, you get, you get one steak dinner a meal, that's all you get. The rest, you've gotta learn how to dig in, you've gotta learn how to delight yourself in God's word, to absorb him, to realize that the Bible is a letter that God from a heart of love has written to you, and yes, I know there's some stuff in there that probably makes us all uncomfortable. But it's quick, it's alive, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword and God will dig deep in your heart, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. God will begin to discern and dissect and illuminate the thoughts and the intents of your heart, not to make you feel bad and not to make you feel dirty, but because God wants you to have a strong foundation. God wants you to have a solid root system. God wants you to be able to still stand the test of time. Even when the floodwaters rise, you will not be moved because if you're planted in in the presence of God, he said, you'll be like a tree by the rivers of water, always being nourished, always being fed. In this constant flow of God's presence, Jesus said, if you believe in me out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. He said, listen, if you'll really get in my presence, you'll find out what life is all about. You know, when I was lost and living the way that I used to live, we were always, we were always trying to hit a new level of high or a new level of drunk. It was like, you know, a badge of honor to have to call and apologize to your friends the next day. Dude, sorry. You know what I was doing? We're always shooting for a new thrill, a new high, a new level. But it's sad to say in the Christian life, we plateau and we become comfortable in that. Well, I'm saved and I know I'm going to heaven and I know I'm secure in Christ and I know the pastor, you know, quotes Bible verses every now and then how that we can't be separated from the love of God. And, and while we're so focused on heaven, we fail to realize that when Jesus saved your soul, he brought literal life inside of you to life. 
And there's a high that you can reach as a believer that'll get you higher. And I don't mean to dumb this down in any way, but it'll get you higher than anything you've ever put in your body. To be in the presence of God, to walk in the fullness of his power, to bask in his glory is the best thing that's ever happened to me. It's the greatest experience that's ever come to my life. And I didn't wake up with a headache or a hangover. and I didn't have to apologize or puke. I just live in peace that passes understanding. And so wholeness is the product of having a strong root system. Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus, he says in chapter three, of verse, uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 14, he says, for this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit, in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, that's having a strong root system, rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according, watch this, to the power that works in us. He said there's a power source in you that unless you've tapped into it, you've not even begun to understand the, the breadth and the length and the depth and the height of God's plan for you. And then he says to explore the love of Christ passes knowledge. So if you think you've got it all figured out, I've got news this morning. None of us do. We're still learning and we're still growing and we're still basking and we're still breathing and we're still absorbing his presence. And he said, this side of heaven, you'll never know it all because God has treasures laid up for you that he wants to reveal in your heart and in your life. He wants to reveal himself. He wants to reveal his grace. He wants you to know what it is to walk in his power. He wants you to know him and the power of his resurrection as Paul said. So wholeness is the product of a strong root system. I want to say number two, that wholeness is freedom from your past. Wholeness is freedom from your past. Are you healed or are you whole? Here's a good litmus test. You're all, you've only been healed if you're still identifying with who you used to be. Because wholeness brings you into another realm. Let the past develop you, but don't ever let the past define you. Allow the past to de develop you. I don't think we should move on in the sense that we forget it. If I forget the stupid stuff I did, I'm probably going to do the same stupid stuff again. So let the past develop you, but don't let the past define you. That's not who you are. You've been given a new name. We used to sing a song when I was a kid that, that went like this. There's a new name written up in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. Some of you old folks and some of you young folks that grew up with old folks would know that song. But I'm glad that in Christ I've been given a new name. I'm glad that in Jesus I don't have to identify with the person that I used to be. Listen, let the past develop you, but never let it define you. If you want to be healed, all you have to do is call on Jesus. But if you want to be whole, you've got to learn to move past and let go of your past mistakes. I said, if you want to be healed, all you got to do is call out to Jesus. Young guy, get close to him. Hey, Jesus, over here. I'm sick. I'm a leper. I'm broken. And he'll heal you. When you get close, he'll make you whole. Ten cleansed, only one came back. It's 10%. I'm really good with math. I mean, I know that was hard, and you're going, Seriously? One out of 10, that's, yeah, one out of 10. It's 10%, right? Seriously terrible with math. That, that is right, isn't it? Just kidding. One out of 10 came back to give him. See, they all found healing. They weren't any less cleansed than, than this one guy. The other nine were no longer lepers. But they never moved past the identity that the world had placed on them. If you want to be healed, all you got to do is call on him. If you want to be whole, you've got to let go of past mistakes. You've got to let go of your bitterness and pain. You've got to forgive in the same way in which you've been forgiven. You've got to rise up from the ashes and stand in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. You've got to move on. This is why I don't identify as a drug addict. 
I was one, or I were one, if you're in Crawford County. That's what I love about you. You don't know the difference. <laughs> That's what I used to be. But I'm not going to live every day of my life in the shadow of the past. I'm not going to live every day of my life still identified by the mistakes that I made. You're not identified by the mistakes that you've made. You're identified by the God who looked on you in love and compassion and mercy and saw your brokenness and saw your mistakes but looked beyond your faults and saw the need of your heart and realized it wasn't what you were doing but the why of what you were doing that he really cared about and he reached down deep into your soul when you called on his name and he set you free and he delivered you and he gave you life abundantly. I'm telling you, I may develop from the past but I'm not gonna dwell in the past and let the past define who I am. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, among several hundred of favorite verses that I have in the Bible, is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 11. It says, and such were some of you. God speaks of your past in past tense. Such were some of you. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. God says, I don't see you for what you've done. I see you for who you are in Christ. I don't see you for the past. I don't see you for your mistakes. I don't see you for your sin. That's what we call the doctrine of imputation. It means that God took all the good in Jesus and placed it on your account. And now when he sees you and when God sees me, he doesn't see my sin. He sees the goodness of his own son inside me. He sees that I was valuable enough in his eyes that he'd give his own life on a cross to set me free. And now God says you are not what you once were. You're not a drunk. You're not a whore. You're not a whoremonger. You're not a drug addict. You're not defined by your, th your thievery and the things that you did yesterday. He said, you are who I say you are, and I say you're free. And he said, if the son will make you free, you're free indeed. Free indeed means no strings attached. Man, it's what religion has a hard time accepting. God's grace is without strings attached. God's contract of love has no addendums and no contingencies. You're in the process of buying a house. Those are good terms to have deleted from the contract. Amen. No addendums, no contingencies. I just, I'm just buying it. It's like a cash deal. No inspections. God's not seeing if you're worthy. He knows that we're all unworthy of his grace, but that's why it's grace. No strings attached. He said, I simply love you. I simply want to be in relationship with you. I simply want to walk with you. I want to talk with you. You don't have to ascend to high, some high level to gain God's acceptance. You have been accepted in the beloved. You have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You have been resurrected. When Jesus rose from the dead, you rose from the dead in the eyes of God. You're alive and you're well. And God simply says, come now and abide and live in this present world that I've placed you in and live the best life that I've prepared for you. You might go through troubles and you might go through trials and you might make mistakes but you are forgiven by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ you've been set free wholeness is freedom from your past it's one thing to be forgiven it's one it's another thing to be set free 10 were cleansed but only one came back and found wholeness and healing you say but man they all were lepers yeah but see the leprosy was just what was taking place in their flesh the healing came when his faith brought him to the presence of Christ. and He began to worship and he knew what it was to recognize the one who'd set him free. Not identified by his disease, but now identified by the one who can heal all diseases. Wholeness is freedom from your past. And I want to say this to you, and this is why this is so important. Wholeness will sustain you through the storms of life. Being healed versus being whole. When you're whole, God will carry you through the storms that life will bring your way. You see, healing always seeks to be delivered out and then complains and feels forsaken when deliverance doesn't come. But wholeness understands that even when God does not deliver me, he would never dismiss me. 
Wholeness believes that the God who calmed and troubled the seas can still the wild storm in me. Even if I face the very worst that the world can throw against me, wholeness understands that though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And God is good on the mountain just like he's good in the valley. And wholeness, when we come into this place of relationship and this place of being filled with the spirit of God, we will go through troubles and storms of life. Being a Christian does not mean you're exempt from problems. When you've been made whole, you realize that even in the darkest night, God's good. Even when you can't find him, you can't feel him. When you're whole, you still trust that his promise said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. You see, when all we've got is healing, we're looking for the next emotional high. But when you've been made whole and you've got a deep root system and you're stable and you're steady and your foundation is secure, you understand that it's not about seeking the next high. It's about trusting and believing and knowing that your faith has made you whole. There'll be times when you can't feel God's presence. There'll be times when you pray and you don't feel like God's listening. There'll be times when you cry out and you pour out your heart, but you just don't feel like the Lord has even paid any attention to your voice. But when you're stable, I'm talking about being secure in your faith, secure in your walk with God. When you're stable, that stability that God has put in you through relationship, not just being healed, but being in his presence, will carry you through the darkest nights, carry you through the darkest waters, will help you when you can't seem to find help anywhere else. There will be times in your life, trust me, this isn't heaven. It's not hell either, but this ain't heaven. And so in this life, you're going to go through trials. You're going to get sick. I got news for you. I did, man, I had a lot of time to do research while we were in this lockdown. I found out that 10 out of 10 people die. The 100% mortality rate among human beings. And we're all going to face it one day. We're all going to face it one day. We're all going to stand beside a loved one as they take their last breath. Many of us have already. And we felt the heartache and the hopelessness and the hurt of goodbyes. <laughs> one of my kids found, David found uh, one of my dad's old tapes. I, it was recorded when I was a little, man, I mean, little kid, like three or four years old. And uh, we were listening to that last night and I was enjoying it for a minute until it got to this song that said, uh, if we never meet again, this side of heaven, I'll meet you on that beautiful shore. My heart hurts for 16 years. My heart has hurt since my dad passed on. My heart has hurt since then as I've stood at the bedside of countless friends and loved ones and had to say goodbye. But the hope that I have in me <laughs> is not some pie in the sky silver lining in every dark cloud there's a real sense of heaven's reality inside of me that I genuinely believe that I'll see him again and I genuinely believe that I'll see other loved ones that have passed on I, I hardly have any family left at my age you're not surprised I'm sure I was a young guy, 40 years old, man. Most of my aunts and uncles, grandparents, my dad's passed on. My mom's in a nursing home with Alzheimer's. Can we all just say it? Life sucks sometimes. It does. Let's be real, dude. Life sucks. Every now and then, it'll suck the life out of you. But when you have a strong foundation and you're rooted and grounded in the love of Christ, wholeness will carry you through the darkest night. Not just being saved, but having a relationship with the God 
who not only made you but loves you and redeemed you with the blood of his own son. Understanding the reality of that. Accepting that is more than just a good sermon illustration or a story that some preacher tells, but the reality of God's glory in eternity, knowing that this life is a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Here's what the Bible says, our light affliction, which is for a moment, will fade in the shadows of the glory that awaits us on the other shore. When you have this hope in you, it'll carry you through the storm. Storms are coming. They have come and they will come. And if your faith is built on sand, it'll be shaken. But if you have a firm foundation, Christ will carry you through the storm. And then it's funny how in that moment and in that season, the bigger picture is not the healing, but the grace that God gives in the midst of pain. It's amazing how when you've ascended from this level of just being healed to being whole, how that in the midst of trial and tribulation, you realize the grace of God is closer to you than it's ever been before, and you experience his presence in ways that you've never experienced. It's amazing how your focus begins to shift, begins to change. When you've not just been healed, but you've been made whole. Are you healed? Or are you whole today? If you're here this morning as your Savior, if you're here today and you've never put your faith in nothing but Jesus, not religion, not your good works, but simply what Jesus did on the cross, then you've never even experienced the healing that God's made available to you. He wants to heal you. Isaiah said, surely he's bore our griefs and carried our sorrow. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was placed upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. There's healing. And there's wholeness. And God wants you to have both. He wants you to be forgiven. But he also wants you to forgive. He wants you to believe, but he also wants you to be believing. He wants you to trust in him, but he also wants you to walk with him. So all across the room this morning, our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I don't know your heart. I don't know what's going on in your life. But to quote, one more time from the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse number 18. Isaiah said, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You say, what do you get when you come to Jesus? Well, before I tell you all that I got, I got to tell you everything I lost. I lost the condemnation. I lost the guilt. I lost the penalty. God took me off trial and wiped the slate clean. He says to you this morning, come now. God says, I want to reason with you. If I would take away every mistake every sin, if I would blot out every time you transgressed, every time you failed, with no strings attached, just simply through the price I paid through Jesus Christ on the cross, God says, let's reason together. Your sins might be scarlet. You've got a stained and checkered past, but I'll make your record white as snow. If you'll simply come, you'll find healing. And when you rise up in his presence, you'll find wholeness. If you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, if you just need prayer, 
I'm here to pray with you. I'm not scared of social distancing or you can get within six feet of me. If you need prayer, I want to pray for you. If you need to be saved, we want to lead you to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here today and you've been saved, but you just haven't gone back to Jesus to worship and say thank you. Why don't you come and do like this leper, fall at his feet and praise his precious name. Father, in Jesus' name we come. Lord, we pray right now that you would speak to every individual's heart. Whether at home or in this house, God, we pray that you would so explicitly reveal to every person what their need is right now. Their need might be to be saved. Their need might be to forgive someone who's hurt them. Their need might be just to let go of something from their past. Father, whatever it is, whether they need comfort, whether they need power, I pray that you'd supply it. I pray that you'd touch every life today. May we leave this place different than we came. In Jesus' name, let's all stand together. If you need to come, the altar's open, the invitation's given. If you need prayer, just wave me down, get my attention.
storm passes better than being at home? <laughs> How different is it? Way different? Like on a scale of 1 to 10? Being here is way like a 13? Okay. Cool. Well, it's way different having you here. It was wearing me out just preaching to a camera. It's different being able to see your faces and expressions. and so It's awesome. Glad you're back. Glad to be back. Well, we're, one thing we're doing different is we're not taking up the offering as we normally would at gunpoint. So, um, no, but if you want to give. Again, our, this church, man, I'm seriously blown away at how faithful everyone's been. Uh, so, But we'll save you a stamp if you want. The buckets are in the back as you pass by. I told the ushers not to let anybody out unless they give at least a dollar. So that's a joke, of course. We're glad you're here. Hey, uh, <clears throat> on another serious note, if you are concerned about being around people, I don't think you are, you wouldn't be here for the most part. But if you are concerned and you don't really want to congregate in the, in the foyer or maybe there's somebody out there that you just would rather not see, you can slip out one of these side doors. If you parked over here, you could slide out this door. We don't let you in this door, but we'll let you out that door if you want to go out that way uh, to the, the side gravel parking lot. And then you can go out this way if you want uh, or just go out the way, you know, we normally do, but just some options for you. See how diversified we are? Anyway, so good to see you. Glad that you're here, and uh, man, just keep praying through this. You know, I've said this in, in videos that we put out, but a lot of people are genuinely nervous and concerned, and um, man, no judgment from me, right? I'm stupid. I don't care. I've done so much ignorant stuff in my life, ain't no way a virus is going to kill me. So... Uh, Anyway, man, there have been some good memes out, like, on Facebook with this stuff. One of my favorites is, like, somebody said, after all the dumb stuff I've done, if I get killed by a virus named after a Mexican beer, I'm going to be ticked. <laughs> I feel the same way. But anyway, let's be dismissed with prayer, and uh, thanks again for coming. Father, thank you so much for your goodness in our lives. I pray that we wouldn't just hear a sermon, but, God, that we'd receive a message today. Please go with us. Lord, may we experience your presence on a daily basis. Help us to understand, God, as the, as the world sort of pushes against us and as our flesh seems to just, uh, just push in the wrong direction so many times, Lord, may we just walk with you every day, Lord, and, and turn to you and trust in you. And uh, Lord, just see what you have in store. I'm excited for the future. I'm excited to see what you're going to continue to do in our lives and in this community. And Lord, we commit our works to you. We want you to get all glory and all honor from all that's done here. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for coming. Good to see you all.